Welcome to this lecture on chest trauma. Our objectives in this lecture are to identify six immediately life-threatening injuries in the primary survey, to identify six potentially life-threatening injuries in the secondary survey, and to learn important procedures in chest trauma like needle thoracostomy, chest tube insertion, and pericardiocentesis, which are the subject of uh, skill stations. Chest trauma causes one in four deaths and it is serious because of its effect on the airway, breathing and circulation. And so it is something that we should take note of quickly and manage actively. Patients with blunt trauma, only about 10% will require an operation and 15 to 30% of penetrating trauma. Therefore, management of chest trauma this is easily within the range or the ability of somebody taking the ATLS course. In pathophysiology of chest trauma, usually chest trauma will cause a ventilation perfusion mismatch and this leads subsequently to hypoxia, hypercarbia and acidosis. The management of chest trauma follows the ATLS principles of primary survey first to identify the greatest threats to life and this goes hand in hand with resuscitation. And then a secondary survey is done to identify all other injuries and potential threats to life. In the secondary survey, there are some conditions which, in which we need a high index of suspicion because they are not usually obvious at the time of examination. The six immediately life-threatening injuries we aim to find in the primary survey are airway obstruction, tension pneumothorax, open pneumothorax, also called sucking chest wound, massive hemothorax, flail chest, and cardiac tamponade. And the six potentially life-threatening injuries, which might be difficult to detect unless we have a high index of suspicion, are pulmonary contusion, myocardial contusion, aortic disruption, traumatic diaphragmatic rupture, tracheobronchial tree disruption, and esophageal disruption. So how does the primary survey management in a chest trauma patient? As always, we check firstly, with, we start with the airway, we check for patency, and we check for retractions in the chest and uh, any noises that might indicate blocked airway. Then in breathing, we expose the patient and check for the rate of respiration and the pattern of breathing or the shallow or deep and we also check for cyanosis. I must uh, mention here that cyanosis is a late sign and we should not depend on it to diagnose problem with ventilation. We then check for circulation and first thing we check for pulses, color and the neck veins are very important because in most situations where there is increased intrathoracic pressure the neck veins will be distended except in patients who are hypovolemic and we must monitor for arrhythmias and this would give us an early indication of myocardial contusion. The initial management of a trauma patient, a revision really of the primary survey in where we check the airway and remember we must maintain cervical spine control. We check for breathing and here we look for tension in motherax, open in motherax, flail chest and circulation Problems might be cardiac tamponade, hemothorax, cardiac contusion, aortic disruption. The last two are not easy to detect. What can be the causes of airway obstruction? One of the commonest and occurs in patients who have got loss of consciousness or who are semi-conscious is the tongue causing obstruction to the airway. Facial fractures can also cause obstruction commonest of which is mandible with loss of support for the tongue. Sometimes you might have foreign bodies, blood of vomitus in the airway and that can cause obstruction. And there might be airway injuries affecting the larynx and the trachea. This might present with strider or noisy respiration. But sometimes they may be difficult to know. We can also through our intervention cause airway obstruction if we place an airway device wrongly. 
how do we diagnose airway obstruction? We note first the patient is out breathing, they may have strider or respiratory distress, they may have hoarseness or change of voice, and uh, patients who, of course who have maxillofacial or neck trauma must give us a high index of suspicion. And if a patient has subcutaneous emphysema, it might be as a result of an injury to the airway with leakage of air into the subcutaneous space. How do we manage airway obstruction? We open the airway, usually the jaw thrust maneuver in a trauma patient, and we must take caution to protect the cervical spine. We put an airway, we suction, and we must we may consider endotracheal intubation. Usually it's indicated that we intubate the patient for definitive airway. And if we're not able to, cricotherotomy, tracheostomy might be necessary. Breathing. So the conditions we might note in breathing. First, most important, because it's a common condition, is tension pneumothorax. And in tension pneumothorax, the problem is that there is a one-way valve allowing air entry into the thoracic cavity and no escape. And this leads to increased pressure and tension in the affected side and it compromises also the normal lung and it also pushes the mediastinum and causes kinking of blood vessels and this leads to obstructive shock so that ventilation and perfusion are both affected and it's a life-threatening injury. It's a clinical diagnosis and should not depend on an x-ray. The way it man manifests is with respiratory distress, tracheal deviation, distended neck veins, tachycardia and hypotension. And uh, the first and most important intervention is to put a needle in the second intercostal space, midclavicular line, then we put a chest tube. There might be complications of tension pneumothorax, like if you misdiagnose, then you create a pneumothorax, it may cause lung laceration or injury to one of the blood vessels of the chest and cellulitis or even empyema thoracis. Sucking chest wound, also called an open pneumothorax, occurs when there's large defect on the chest wall. If a defect is greater than two-thirds the tracheal diameter, air passes preferentially through this defect into the pleural cavity instead of passing through the trachea because of less resistance. This air does not take part in gaseous exchange and so it will compromise respiration. The management is to immediately cover the wound with the cleanest occlusive dressing, leaving one side to create a flap valve. Flail chest occurs when there's loss of bony continuity of a section or segment of the rib cage with the rest of the rib cage and might result from multiple rib fractures or fracture and dislocation two or more ribs at the costochondral joints and it results in paradoxical movement of the, that segment with the respiration. Usually there is also concomitant lung contusion and this is usually the problem. It is not easy to note a uh, flail chest because initially owing to the pain the patient tends to have shallow breathing and so the flail segment is not obvious and 30% can be missed within the first six hours. Management is by intubating and ventilating the patient and we must also be careful on how we use fluids because we don't want to worsen the lung contusion. And pain relief is very important because it helps to improve chest excursion. Flay chest is a significant marker of injury and a study published in the Journal of American College of Surgeons 1994 showed that there were 92 patients studied in a level 1 trauma center. 46 of these also had pulmonary contusion, 70% had a pneumo or hemothorax and 27% developed ARDS, 69% required mechanical ventilation and 33% died. Note that uh, in this study, no great vessel or tracheobronchial injuries were noted. Circulation. Problems that might affect circulation in chest trauma is massive hemothorax and cardiac tamponade. And massive hemothorax is defined as greater than 
1.5 liters of blood drained from the chest drain and if there's also continuing losses of more than 200 ml of blood per hour for about 4 hours and this indicates usually a significant vessel injury there is usually a systemic or high light injury as a result of blunt trauma there's usually loss of breath sound on the affected side and there's dullness to percussion and hypoxia management is a chest tube and uh, usually we have to transfuse the patient and we prefer to use to collect the blood through a sterile chest tube and do auto transfusion and this is one of the indications where an emergency thoracotomy is indicated to stop further losses we must group and cross match the patient and transfuse thank you for your attention